is an organization founded on the virtues of civil rights, equal rights. Thank you. That's much better. And so as we celebrate today, again, we'd like to thank you for joining us. We've got an excellent program for you today. Uh, recently, we relaunched the NAACP Forum on BCA. We've got an excellent host for that program. He will be emceeing this morning. And so, again, we appreciate you. We make a plea for your membership in the, in the NAACP. We have a lot of exciting things this year planned. And we have an excellent speaker. We plan to get you out of here at the appointed time. And so uh, we will begin our program with me introducing our MC for the morning. That is Bishop Tony Branch. Well, it's truly an honor to be here today celebrating the 30th uh, breakfast that we have given. But if you believe in justice, give yourself a hand clap. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you in here. If you believe in justice, give yourself a hand clap. Now, normally we go right into the invocation, but I'm going to say one thing real quick. I noticed that what we did on our flyer, we said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I read somewhere where they said that we are no longer relevant in the civil rights movement. If you believe that that's a lie, clap your hands. somewhere that they say that we don't have anything more to fight about. If that was wrong and that's a lie, clap your hands. I read somewhere where they said that it's only a black issue. If you believe that that's a lie, clap your hands. And the reason why this is still relevant in the civil rights movement because we remember Freddie Gray. If you remember Freddie Gray, clap your hands. If you want justice for Trayvon Martin, clap your hands. If you believe in justice for Sandra Bland, clap your hands. If you believe that we're still relevant, clap your hands. And let us not forget Tamara Rice. So for those of you who think that we got cobwebs behind our ears, and that our feet are stuck to the ground like crazy glue. Ah, oh, you're wrong. There is justice to be had, and we are going to continue to fight for justice. Clap your hands if you believe that. I know that we are tight for time. At this time, I'm going to ask that the invocation uh, be given by a great colleague uh, in the ministry, Reverend Creighton. Reverend Creighton, please. Give him a minute. Welcome back to the podium. God bless you. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this grand opportunity to gather in fellowship at this memorial breakfast. We ask, Lord, that you allow your Holy Spirit to be present in everything that we say or do today. Lord, we understand and we heard in your word what you said, that righteousness exalteth a nation. Sin brings a reproach. We also understand through history that righteousness is awfully empty without justice. Lord, we ask that you would energize all of those under the sound of my voice, that they would seek to fulfill the legacy that Dr. King has left. We ask that you would energize the will of the NAACP in Brockton, that they not be discouraged but be encouraged, that they would uh, gain a new sense of urgency, to be an advocate for those who are voiceless, to be an advocate for those who are marginalized. Yeah. Lord, we ask that you would bring all colors together, red, yellow, black, and white, 
that we might come together for the common good. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, that within this fellowship, that we might find new resolves, new ideas that will provoke us on to doing good, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us thus far. We live, we realize that we live in some unprecedented times. Lord, there are things that are new to us. There are things that require new answers. There are things that require new solutions. We ask that somehow, during this breakfast memorial service, that we will find some of the answers to our questions. We allow you, we ask the Lord that you would bless the speaker of the hour that a voice is heard is not his own, Lord, that we understand that your word will not come back void, but it will do what it was sent out to accomplish. Lord, we give you all the glory and the praise. Anything positive that will come out of this event, we give you the glory, careful to give you the praise. In Jesus Christ, my Lord's name, I pray. Let the church say amen. Thank you, Reverend Creighton, and God bless you. At this time, we are going to have a selection led by Sharon Molden, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Sister Sharon Molden in the house. There's nothing like having Sister Sharon Molden. Please give her a hand clap. Uh, as we say in the Pentecostal church, the anointing is on her life. Amen. At this time, we're going to have uh, President Stephen Bernard come up to give uh, presidential, what they call president remarks and welcoming. Let us give Steve Bernard a hand clap. God bless you. I'm so grateful for you all coming out this morning, as I am every year. It's a pleasure to see you. So many friends, so many new friends, so many sponsors, so many wonderful people. Thank you for joining me. Good morning and welcome to the 30th Annual Dr. Martin Luther King Breakfast. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Our keynote speaker 
is Reverend Brendan Thomas Crowley. In your programs, in your program, program booklets, please turn to the back inside cover, the back inside cover, where you'll see a picture of our loving friend, Josette Dubois. My special guests this morning are Dominique and Stephen Dubois with their aunt and uncle Rosemary and Linda LeBlanc. Would they please be stand, please, be recognized? Thank you so much for coming. Dominique has allowed me to share with you my words of reflection of Josette given at her funeral last Saturday. From the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24 through 26, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. We are blessed for the life of our beloved Josette. We now solemnly celebrate her life. Even in our sorrow, there is overwhelming joy that Josette brought to us with her compassion and her appetite for life. Josette's greatest gift is her children, Dominique, Stephen, and Robert, raised in a manner of principles that include principles of religion, education, social behavior, and principles of love. There is no doubt that Dominique, Stephen, and Robert will be shining examples of Josette's legacy. Josette was a member of the Brockton area branch of the NAACP. Throughout her many years of service, Josette was an executive committee member, assistant treasurer, assistant secretary, act so chairperson, act so committee member, Martin Luther King breakfast committee member, superintendent of public schools and Brockton High School principal recognition committee member, and in 2014, our 60th anniversary. Quoting from the words of Vina Ulysses, a fellow teacher at Brockton High School, Josette made it her purpose to help and support others. Her advice and guidance were always well received. I am particularly grateful for her contribution to our ACT SO program. ACT SO standing for Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics. As both chairperson one year and committee member in others, Josette recruited colleagues from Brockton High School and other friends in education to mentor students for the local and national academic competitions. Our AXO program under her leadership was recognized for excellence both regionally and nationally. Even greater than, than her contribution to the NAACP are the bonds of friendship that Josette naturally casts with an innumerable amount of people over her lifetime. <coughs> Remembered as a dedicated, loving, and modest woman Let's not forget her great sense of humor. On December 23rd, Wednesday, just before Christmas, Josette attended a committee meeting for the upcoming, and now, the Martin Luther King breakfast. I was her driver. Upon leaving, I backed my car into a, into a car that had surprisingly pulled in behind us. The driver was very upset with me. Josette must have felt it necessary to lend her advice and guidance to our heated conversation. She said, Sir, Mr. Bernard did not see you. The driver said, what do you mean he didn't see me? Stevie Wonder could have seen me. <laughs> Josette repeated his words, but in a quizzical manner. Stevie Wonder could have seen you? And then she broke out in boisterous laughter that lasted for more than several seconds. The driver was so shocked by her laughter that his demeanor changed, and we were able to conduct business in a civil manner. On the way home, driving on Ash Street, I, play, I passed Central Street. Josette said, Mr. Bernard, you just passed my street. Stevie Wonder could have seen this. this <laughs> my tears for the loss of Josette are mixed with tears of loving friendship, a friendship that I always treasure, a friendship that I'll always treasure. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you.
Joining us today. Okay, well, thank you, Dominique. Joining us today, uh, I'd like, I'm not going to remember everyone who is here, uh, but I would like to point out a number of uh, number of people who are here. Our Mayor Bill Carpenter, former Mayor Jack Units, City Council is Shirley Azak, Shana Barnes, Tim Cruz, Robert Sullivan. Superintendent of Public Schools, uh, Kathleen Smith, and former Superintendent of P Brockton Public Schools, Robert C. Jones. Our Fire Chief, Mike Williams. Our Chief Financial Officer, Jay Condon. Election Commission, Commissioner, uh, John McGarry. Brockton Emergency Manager, Steve Hooks. State Representatives, Claire Cronin, Michelle Dubois, Senator Mike Brady. Candidates for the representative seat vacated by uh, Michael Brady, Shirley Azak, Shana Barnes, and Jerry Cassidy. Brockton School Committee, uh, Brockton High School Principal Sharon Wolder, with a table of Brockton High School students and their sponsor Harold Bo Marrow, former principal, BHS principal Eugene Marrow, Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, corporate sponsors and friends and family, and I'm counting on Tony Branch maybe to. Uh, recall other people that I've that I've missed, uh, but I thank you so much for coming out on behalf of the offices, the executive committee, the MLK Breakfast Committee, and the volunteers. Thank you for the, for supporting the uh, the NAACP. Following the breakfast, uh, we invite you to our Prostate Cancer Awareness Forum, forum brought to you by the Brockton Branch NAACP, Admitech Foundation, and Good Samaritan Medical Center. Dr. Faina Stern, the president and founder of AdmiTech, is with us this morning. Dr. Stern is sitting up front here, along with her director of community development, Mr. Chris Pond. Prostate cancer is an epidemic with black men dying at a rate of two and a half times that of white men. Help us save our brothers' lives. The Brockton Branch NAACP Health Committee has formed a prostate cancer awareness team and uh, we have a number of team members here with us today. If they would just raise their hands, Brock, prostate team members over here. Thank you for the volunteer. It's a grassroots river. We, are, we encourage you to, to, to join us. I'm, I'm wrapping up because I stand between you and breakfast. But I want to remind you of Dr. Martin Luther King that on, on March 25th, 1966, at the annual meeting of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, Dr. King is quoted as saying, of all forms of discrimination and injustice, inequalities in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Our work is vital and still very necessary. Enjoy your meal prepared, your, prepared for us by the Shaw Center. Enjoy the fellowship at your tables and with your friends. Then be ready for our keynote speaker, Brandon Crowley. I love you and I thank you very much for coming. I'd like also to take personal privilege to uh, wish the family the blessings upon the family of uh, Euclid Wooten, who passed, and his services being held at Messiah Baptist right now. Thank you again. Enjoy the day. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> If we've missed anyone or any individuals doing the announcement, charge it to our mind, not to our heart. There's a lot of people here and a lot of people that couldn't make it. I know Gary Keith couldn't make it because he had to work, but charge it to our mind, not our heart. God bless you. At this time, I know that you all are hungry because I am. Amen. And I'm looking at these fine folks over here. So the breakfast buffet is going to begin, and I understand, uh, not to be out of order, that it is going to go by table. Am I right on that? It's going by table? Okay, so the, the ushers will come around now uh, for the uh, breakfast buffet. Buffet. Breakfast buffet. Excuse me, buffet. Excuse me. Y'all can tell I'm tired, huh? Lord Jesus, four hours of sleep. Uh, they're going to come around this time. And we appreciate the arrival of Jay Stewart, amen, wherever he might be. God bless you. God bless him. Amen. So let's begin this breakfast buffet.
And then at that point, Sharon, are you going to come up here and, and grace us uh, with your anointing and song? Mr. President, is there something? You want me to acknowledge each one? Amen. As we, uh, I'm not going to hold up people from eating because that would be out of order. But I do want to acknowledge, uh, per the direction of my president, that uh, the elected officials here today, State Senator Mike Brady, Senator Brady, if you can stand so we can recognize you for those who don't know you. If uh, State Representative Michelle Duvois, as well as Claire Cronin, can stand where they are and wave their hand. Mayor Bill Carpenter in the house. Mayor Carpenter? Not yet. Not yet, amen. He'll be here. City Councilors, uh, Winthrop Farwells, these folks are at large. They represent the entire city. Winthrop Farwell, please stand if you can. Right over there. Congratulations on your election. Uh, Shayna Barnes. Shayna Barnes in the house. Shayna Barnes back there. And I, my personal privilege and my good friend Bob Sullivan, where is he? Amen. And of course, Moses Rodriguez. Moses Rodriguez, amen. Okay. Not here yet as well. Uh, Tom Cruise, Ward 1. Tim Cruise. <laughs> Tim Cruise. <laughs> Need my glasses on. Anyway, uh, Tom Monaghan, I apologize. Tom Monaghan, Ward 2. Dennis Aranini, am I saying that wrong? Aranini. Is Dennis here? Paul Stavinsky, Ward 4. Ann Bogart, Ward 5. My good young friend, Jack Lally, Ward 6. And Ward 7, Shirley Azak. We want to recognize Sheriff Joe McDonald, Plymouth County. Register of Deeds, John Buckley. Remember people, on your hand clap, these are folks that are supporting us. Uh, these are justice fighters along with us. So let's give a, a rounding hand clap if we can. Southeastern Regional School Committee, Mark Lindy. Mark is over there, and I believe we have uh, Tom uh, Min Min Mincello of the Brockton School Committee. I believe we have Brett Gormley and Tim Sullivan. Did I miss anyone from the Brockton School Committee? Now, I have some personal privileges here. God bless you. My good friend Jack Reardon is here, a former Plymouth County Commissioner, an attorney in this city. Jack. I'm talking about justice fighters, people. And I know that we have members from various associations. Joseph Francois, Marlene Amity, amen, give them fellow justice fighters with the NAACP. I know there's members from the Cape Verdean Association here, from the Latino Association here, fellow justice fighters, amen. So we thank them, we thank you all uh, for your presence. And now if I missed anybody, please, again, Charge it to the mind, not to the heart, because we love you. We love you. My dear, why don't you, why don't you come up here and just wave your hand then? Sheriff, the sheriff, he's running for sheriff. Wave your hand then. If you go. <laughs> That's Scott Becky, everybody. He's waving his hand. I want to make sure he gives you this acknowledgement. Now, we are, now, just like we're non-denominational, we are non-political here. I want to make it clear. Because justice has no party. If you believe that, you need to clap your hands. Justice has no political party. We are Americans in this place today. Clap your hands. Amen. Now y'all continue to eat your food and I'll then have, amen, we'll have Sharon Molden come up. But let's eat, eat a little bit more food before we do that. And remember, we got to move the program along because we have important life-saving work with the prostate cancer awareness that is on today. Uh, so please, we, whatever we do, we will move swiftly.
folks that will be coming up, and if you're going to give any comments, I would ask that you be brief. A minute is nice, two minutes may be too much, just so that we can concentrate on this epidemic uh, with black men with respect to prostate cancer. If you believe that, that you can help me in that, clap your hands. I want y'all to engage, be engaged, be engaged. Because the frustration is, is that people feel that justice ends when you leave here. In other words, the work for justice ends. But I want you to leave here and to continue to be starlets and fighters for us. Amen? I want to acknowledge William Brewer, our Executive Vice President. William, if you could please raise your hand. Phyllis Ellis, working hard, she's at the door. Phyllis, where is Phyllis? Leona Martin, another, just, just wonderful people, working hard behind the scenes to get this work done. Janet Trask, Janet, oh my lord, she's walking around taking pictures. Miles Jackson, Miles. Adam Swinson, Swinson, I apologize. Adam's over there, helps us with this booklet, he's a blessing. And Danny Steele, another hard worker, Danny Steele. I understand that we have the presence of Robert Jenkins, the BRA, is he here? Give Robert Jenkins recognition, please. And our, Bo our Brockton School Superintendent. Did we miss her, Kathy? Are you here? There you go. Stand up, please. Please, stand up. The work that the school department is doing, the superintendent is doing, we need to recognize that. At this time, it's important for the process of recognition to go forward. I'm going to ask that Stephen Bernard join me on the podium and State Representative Claire Cronin. Representative Cronin. Please give these fine people a hand clap. Could the rest of the state delegation please come to the podium? The rest of the state, Michelle. And let's give this delegation as president a hand clap. Good morning. Uh, we would like to offer this citation from the Massachusetts House of Representatives to the Brockton area the Brockton NAACP, and as it says, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives and the Massachusetts Senate offers its sincerest congratulation to the Brockton NAACP in recognition of the 30th anniversary of the Dr. Martin Luther King breakfast and for the great work you do in our community. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and confirms success in all endeavors. And it's signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo, and our Brockton delegation, State Senator Michael Brady, State Representative Michelle Dubois, and myself, Claire Cronin. So congratulations. <laughs> I'm a member and everybody else should be too. Yes, you may have your citation. Oh, my. <laughs> my, my, my. <laughs> I want to, uh, I just had a note here, the beautiful flower arrangements at the NAACP uh, every year, mostly every year that uh, Shirley Azak does. We need to, why don't we give her a hand clap as well. He's a, Remember that yellow represents faith and love and hope. 
faith, love, and hope. And so that's important today. Uh, at this time, uh, I need to hear a song. And we got Sister Sharon Molden in the house, and we'll ask her to bless us one more time. God bless you. I guess, I guess the bishop will sit down now. <laughs> This song is taken from Sweet Honey in the Rock. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. How many of you know that it hasn't come yet? But we who believe in freedom cannot rest. It's called Ella's Song, and it's from Sweet Honey in the Rock. Accompanying me this morning is Dr. Dennis Slaughter from the Boston Community Choir and from Songs for Me and Me. Shine on me. I just want to be 
I want to leave you with this selection called Glory from the film Selma. One day when the glory comes, it will be ours. One day when the war is won, we will be sure. But until it comes, we're going to fight on to the finish, no matter what's said or done. Because one day when the glory comes, it will be ours. in here. I could say some things. Amen. I want to take an opportunity in memorial, not only for our great sister Josette, a moment of silence, but also for Senator, did we have a great senator uh, that represented us, Tom Kennedy. If you can take a moment of silence, just one minute to meditate, to meditate on their presence and what they meant to you in your life your own personal spiritual privilege. If you believe that, take that moment, amen.
Thank you. I'm just going to go here, go through our program because I'm actually missing um, some very good written material on the Axel program. If someone, if anyone has it, can they bring that up? I apologize. It was here, but it's not here. If not, I want to at least recognize the Axel program. Uh, that is to our left. She's coming up right now. And also the recipient that received the award on last year. I'm going to ask that the young woman come and join me for a moment. Because this is the example of what we're talking about when we speak of justice. High school students that are in this house today, where are you? Can you stand up on your feet, please? Join me, join me up on this podium. If we, if we can't take time for our future while we're here, come, 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 very quickly, come. Come, high school students. Come, 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 come. If we, if we can't take time for, the, for them, our future while we're here. Join me, join me, join me. We criticize our kids, but look at this here. Look around me. This is our future. This is the future of Brockton. This is the future of Plymouth County. Boston, Massachusetts, the great Commonwealth. This is our future. You do it every minute for them. Do you agree with me? Clap your hands. So what does the NAACP do? They have AXO, which is an Afro an academic, cultural, technological, excuse me, and scientific Olympics for these folks. It's mentoring and enrichment is a program of the NAACP's for grades 9 through 12. 30 different categories. The Brockton area branch is proud to have reestablished the program last year. Give the NAACP a hand clap for that. Now I like this word here, our success. That's you and me, that's everybody here. Last year was amazing as our two top local winners went on to the national competition in Philadelphia. And each of them brought home a second silver medal as well as $1,700 in cash and an iPad. If you believe in social justice, if you believe in our teens, you believe in our high school students, clap your hands. We are very proud, if I said this wrong, I apologize, for Tainane Amir, am I saying that wrong? Tanya Amir, am I, God bless you. Chelsea Ski, Chelsea is over there at the AXO table, but she's now with me, we can get rid of that. She has experience in both local and national competitions. Wave your hand, where are you? Come, come over here, come over here. Let, let, let people see that. My point to you is this, you look at the one, but look at the multitude. Do you believe what I'm telling you? Look at the multitude of our future here. So when you see the so-called bad kids, think about what you're seeing here. And this is why we're doing it, amen? This year's mentoring program is starting in a few weeks. If you know of any high school student Please see Chelsea and pick up a brochure over there, over to your right or to your left. If you believe in these kids, once again, clap your hands. Thank you, kids. Young adults. Thank you, young adults. As our mayor always says, young adults. Now, y'all saw all those teens that were up here, them high school students. I expect all of them to be members very soon. <laughs> so do not forget that you need to become members of the NAACP. We need membership. Amen. It, it funds these programs and it helps us continue on in our battles. 
in support of righteousness and social justice across this country. At this time, I'm going to ask, and if I'm out of order, I believe I would like to see uh, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Mayor Bill Carpenter, if he can join us on the uh, podium to say a few words. And anything that I've missed, I'll come right back to fairly, fairly quickly. Mayor Bill Carpenter, please give him a hand. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, I thought, and I always, I brought a quote. I have to, have to have a quote. The time is always right to do what is right. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I think in the wake of a campaign season and an election, uh, the time is right now. Uh, I had the opportunity shortly after the last election to meet with the NAACP board and some of the members to speak openly and honestly about some issues and statements that came up during the campaign that I think we all agreed uh, required a conversation. And I left that meeting that night uh, really thinking about some of the things that had been said. And one of the challenges or criticisms that was brought to me that night was that this city really did not have a formal board or advisory committee or group of concerned diverse residents to talk about issues in this city like race relations and equal opportunity. And uh, so in giving that a lot of thought since then, I look back and trying to come up with an idea I realized that we didn't really need a new idea. We'd had an idea that had been allowed to go silent, and that was the city's diversity commission. And prior to my becoming mayor, that voice had gone silent. When I looked it up, the appointments to that commission had all expired in 2011 and 2012. So that voice has been silent for a few years. So I thought that this would be the perfect opportunity to share with you that we are going to immediately recreate and reinstate the city's diversity commission and on Tuesday I will send 11 nominations to the city council. On Tuesday I will send 11 nominations up to the city council and ask the city council for their swift uh, for their swift consideration and confirmation of those appointments so that we can get to work. And when we announce that commission next week, I think you'll believe that it really is a group of uh, diverse and committed people who all universally care about the future of this city. And we haven't formalized a couple of the spots yet, but I can assure you that out of the 11 members, at least three and probably four will be NAACP members of the Brockton chapter, that this organization, this organization will not only have a voice at the table, it'll have several voices at the table. And we're going to work together to take on the challenges that face us all. And I look forward to some really difficult, uncomfortable conversations at some of those meetings. Because if we don't have some difficult, uncomfortable conversations, we're not going to be doing our job. And I think that the way change happens is when we make some of us uncomfortable. Because when we all get comfortable, nothing changes. And I think that this commission is going to be, I'm going to challenge them, and I'm telling them to challenge me and hold me accountable. So I look forward to some of those difficult conversations. I, I, I'm hoping that these conversations are like conversations around the family dinner table. Because when you sit at the family dinner table, you know that everyone at the table loves each other, so they can say exactly what they think, and when the conversation's over, they still love each other. And I'll tell you, I get some of my harshest criticism, believe it or not, when I go home. So, you know, I've got a house full of people who think I should do some things differently. But we're able to have those conversations, and I want those same types of conversations to take place at this commission. You know, there's a lot for us to talk about. Um, you know, we need to talk about linguistic inequality. Now, you know, 
In both the white and African American communities, that's not always a popular conversation. But it's a conversation all of us at the table need to have together. But at the same time, we need to have a conversation about income inequality and ensuring that we are creating the same opportunities for all of those young people that we just saw, that every young person in this city grows up with the same opportunities so that we don't have to have conversations about income inequality in the future. Because I really want Brockton to be a 21st century city of opportunity. And for us to truly be a city of opportunity, we've got to be a city of equal opportunity. So, thank you. And that means equal opportunity in housing, equal opportunity in employment, equal opportunity uh, to take advantage that we can, each young person growing up here has the opportunity to take advantage and become successful with their own particular skill set. So, uh, I look forward and I ask for your support as we bring this diversity commission back to life next week. Uh, I ask you to reach out to the members of the commission, come to meetings, and uh, I will challenge them, they'll challenge me, and we're going to make Brockton into a better city. Thank you. Mayor Bill Carpenter, we thank you for that. At this time, we are going to uh, personal order again to ask the senior member of the state delegation, Senator Michael Brady, to give us a few words, please. Mike Brady, Senator. Yes. That's a scary thought, being the senior member. I, I always, I'm still young at heart, even though I've got gray hairs a little bit out of shape there, but. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today and very honored to be a member of the NAACP and I encourage everyone who hasn't joined to join uh, under the leadership of Steve Bennett who was a former president many, many years ago and I've known Steve and his family for many years and all the members. We've got an important uh, thing to speak about after this breakfast about prostate cancer and I'm going to be speaking on that. I'm uh, a member of that committee and we have to get the message out and uh, I've got some other words to speak on that later but a lot of uh, young men are not getting their health checked properly and prostate cancer awareness has to be brought to the forefront, especially within the African community because the word isn't getting out to the people. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't, I, I'm like a stubborn old man sometimes and fortunately I, I've got the cholesterol that runs in the family. My father did have prostate cancer himself and fortunately he was a veteran of World War II and he was had great care through the VA hospital and the VA healthcare system, but the word's got to get out to all of us about getting checked. It's a very important issue, and it's something that, you know, in the in the line lighting when you're with your friends, you might joke about and so forth, but it's a very serious issue, so we have to address this, and I'm going to be speaking briefly when we come up later for that, but uh, as everyone said and the mayor said, it's very important. I'm, I'm grateful to the mayor for reforming this diversity community committee and it's very important to get people involved in at the state level. I, I'm a state senator, I go to Boston, I don't go there every day. My most important thing is being in the district and not only now do I just represent the city of Brockton as a senator, I represent the towns of Northeastern, Whitman, Hanson, Halifax, Hanover, East Bridgewater and Plimpton. So if you know anybody in those towns or anybody from those towns are here today as well as the city of Brockton, we work for you. The state house is the people's house, it's not our house as elected official. Everyone here is always welcome to come into the state house and any ideas you have and any things you think we should be doing at the state level, please don't hesitate to contact me because we work for you. We work for the people, all the people. And that's what this country is founded on and this is what this commonwealth is founded on. The state house is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, state government building in the country. So you're always welcome and if you want me to meet with you here in the community, I'm always ready and available to meet with you on any ideas. We're, we're dealing with a budget situation coming up, and I don't want to be too long because we've got a busy schedule, but the budget is so important. We de depend greatly in this community of Brockton on our state budget. And when I first got elected as a city council and a school community member, we had money flowing in. It was great. I worked under the leadership of Mayor Jack Units. We had a great city council and school committee, and we had great funding from our state. We built five elementary schools with 90% reimbursement from the state. We built a council and aging facility named after our good friend Tom Kennedy's mother, the Mary Kennedy Senior Center. 
We got funding, funding for our library, which was built with a Carnegie grant at the turn of the last century, but it was never handicapped accessible. So without the church community in Brockton, the Brockton Interfaith Community, we all went in and lobbied the legislature at the time to override a former governor's veto of our funding for our libraries, and we're able to make our beautiful downtown library handicap accessible, so it has access for everybody. And um, it was working, and the economy was doing good. Then I got elected into the state house, and all of a sudden the crash happened. We had difficult budgetary cuts. And we, fortunately, we had a rainy day fund, like a savings account, so we could replenish and put money back into the budget to help continue the services that we depend greatly from the state. And again, the economy started to get better. Things are going good. We're getting more funding, funding for our schools with Chapter 70 money, which Brockton depends greatly on, funding for our roads with Chapter 90 money, which is in deplorable condition. Finally, West Elm Street, uh, got approved and, and we had the groundbreaking a couple months ago that's long overdue, not to mention every other road in the city and you need access for the residents, you need access for the businesses to help promote Brockton, to get more people in here to help invest in Brockton, which is so important. But now the governor came out and we're facing another deficit because the health care costs are continuing to rise and pensions and we have to fund the things we're obligated to fund so there's some cuts coming back but we're going to continue to work with our delegation, not only Representative Claire Cronin and Michelle Dubois, but our city councils and all of the other elected officials in our school committee to work to get funding for our community here because it's so important. And, uh, you know, people don't like to pay taxes and people complain, and I don't like to pay taxes, but without that tax revenue, we wouldn't be able to have the services that we have in the city of Brockton that we depend so greatly on. So, any ideas you think we should be doing? We're looking at, there is a bill out there to tax people making over a million dollars. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of other legislation up there and ways to get money for, for revenue. And then there was a gas tax that, you know, people complain about gas prices. The gas, a gallon of gas cost $4 a couple years ago. Now it's dropped to less, less than $2. But that would have helped funding some of the roads. So we need to be creative and we need to come and get new businesses here. And Brockton is a gateway city. So we have a gateway city delegation too with all the other cities in the Commonwealth outside of Boston. You know, it's great G's going to Boston, and I love Monty Walsh, he's a great friend of ours, and he's a great supporter, but we need the money to come down on the South Shore. We're fighting for two community college situations in Brockton that got cut from our governor. One is a college collaboration for downtown with the University of Massachusetts, Bridgewater State, and Massachusetts Community College, so important for our downtown, because when the high school got built in 1970, a beautiful school, it's like a college campus up here, it's wonderful, but we lost the foot traffic in downtown. And then when the malls get built, and this happens in every community, malls are wonderful, but they took away from our downtowns. So when we've been working for years, this idea isn't anything new, it's been worked upon since Jack Eunice was a mayor, and it's continued to be worked on with our current mayor, Bill Cobb, and our state delegation. This is so important for Brockton, and I need your help to help lobby the governor so we can get this funding in place. We've met with the administration several times. But it's so important for Brockton. And then Massasoit Community College. We had a proposal for an allied health care center there. The nursing program alone at Massasoit has a waiting list of over 100 students with perfect grade point averages. And health care is where the jobs are. We, we need to create more jobs for our citizens. So this is a great opportunity to create jobs for the, not only the city of Brockton but the South Shore. And it's wonderful that under the leadership of Governor Patrick, Bridgewater State got funding, they're growing tremendously, University of Massachusetts continue to grow, but we have to fund our community colleges. I, I grew up in Brockton and I couldn't afford to go anywhere else, I was very fortunate, I worked at Superior Bakery, the, the third shift, and I was very fortunate that I was able to go to Massachusetts. It's a wonderful school and I worked there many, many years later with a grant to help people get pre-apprenticeship training programs. So Massasoit Community College is here, it's growing, it's continuing to grow, and we need to help to support our community colleges. So any help that you can give us at the state level and the local level, please don't hesitate to contact us. And I'm going to be up here later to speak on the prostate issue again, so thank you very much for having us here and God bless you. Thank you, Senator Brady. One thing we know about Senator Brady, he's thorough. <laughs> he's thorough. I'm going to acknowledge uh, other members of the NAACP. I think it's very important. Do we have lifetime? Do we have lifetime members here? And if we do, can they stand so we can recognize you? Lifetime members of the NAACP, please. We have Ozzie. 
and, and also, I recognize our uh, young folks that are in high school, but let's recognize those that are in elementary school education as well, younger folks. Give them a hand clap, please. And I'm unsure if I recognize Ward 4 school committee member, Brett Gormley, who's in the rear here. Brett, can you stand up? Give him a hand clap. And I am glad to talk, I'm glad to uh, introduce to some uh, Michael Alkins, the uh, president of the Minority Court Officers Association, which is new. This is an important organization that's going to be helping our minority officers. Michael's right here, please, uh, if you can recognize them. That would be very, very nice. At this time, I'm going to ask that um, Leona Martin join us. I'm going to help her here. Give Leona, uh, this is, she's a, a worker. Boy. And Leona's going to introduce our speaker. Uh, Reverend Crawley. Sorry. Good, morning. Good morning. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, the <laughs> Reverend Brandon Crowley. Um, I was going to read this about him, but he wants me to read this. <laughs> so I assume he'll, he'll talk a little bit more about what he's been doing. Um, so. The Reverend Brandon Thomas Crowley is the senior pastor of the historic Myrtle Baptist Church in Newton, Massachusetts. Founded by free slaves in 1874, it is one of the oldest black churches in New England and one of Boston metro area's fastest growing congregations. Under Reverend Crowley's leadership, the church has raised thousands of dollars for HIV and AIDS and cancer research, started a prison ministry to assist incarcerated persons in pursuing a secondary education, established the Myrtle History Museum, and partnered with the Brookville <coughs> House in the City Mission Society of Boston to help eradicate poverty. Reverend Crowley graduated <coughs> MAGA Cum Laude and religion from Morehouse College, named the Martin Luther King Jr. International Scholar. He earned a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School, where he was a Presidential Scholar, the National Baptist J.H. Jackson Scholar, and the Hopkins Scholar for Religious Diversity and Parish Ministry. He wrote his thesis on the demonization of honesty how the black church subconsciously defies the closet. In 2012, Reverend Crowley graduated with a second master's degree in sacred theology from Boston University School of Theology and is also presently continuing his academic studies at Boston University pursuing a PhD in theology with a concentration in religion and society. Please welcome Reverend Brandon Crowley. Good morning. Good morning. Look to the person next to you and say, I hope this boy is not long. <laughs> Now, I wanted to give you permission to do what I often do after sitting through a political affair that's associated with food. I often wonder how long is this speaker going to be? What is it that they want me to hear? Say it, let's go home. I want to just begin this morning by saying a word of thanks first to uh, the wonderful new friend uh, that I now have who introduced me uh, this morning, Mrs. Martin, thank you so very much for that introduction. She came and she said, I have this lengthy introduction. I said, oh no, please don't do that because I don't even want to hear all of that. Uh, but thank you so very much for that introduction. I also want to acknowledge 
Uh, Mr. Bernard, who's the president of the Brockton area branch of the NAACP, the breakfast committee for this event, and the chair of that, Mr. William Brewer, and the other members of the Brockton area branch of the NAACP. Would you all please stand again so that we can honor you? Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to share a few words with you. I want to talk for a moment this morning from the topic, the beloved community. During my time as a King Scholar, I had the opportunity to study Dr. King beyond just the I Have a Dream speech. He was quite an interesting personality, but not only that, but he was an unbelievably powerful and prophetic academic who wrote passionately about Christian concepts, but he wrote about them in a way that made them applicable to persons in all walks of life. That's what makes the name Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. So, this morning I want to talk from the phrase, the beloved community. Can you say that with me, the beloved community? The On August 28th, 1963, Martin King said these familiar words. He said, I have a dream that one day my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And although the presence of a black man in the White House, I'm putting percussion on those words intentionally, although the presence of a black man in the White House might suggest that Dr. King's dream has indeed become true, the fact that police officers killed more than 100 unarmed black people in 2015 and the fact that Donald Trump is bold enough to publicly declare that he wants to build a wall to keep the colored skin of ignorance out of the land of the free and the home of the brave makes me worry that Dr. King's dream is still just a dream. For Dr. King, his dream was for the whole world <coughs> to be transformed into the beloved community. But the only way for the beloved community to be made manifest, beloved, Dr. King argues, is that we must be the beloved community. So my question for us this morning is, what does it mean to be the beloved community? I want to share with you this story to sort of talk about this concept, this philosophical concept of the beloved community. When I first moved to Boston to attend Harvard University in the heart of August, which is one of the warmest months of the New England calendar year, I thought to myself, being the warm-blooded Georgia boy that I still am on the inside, I thought living up here ain't that bad. But then January rolled around. <laughs> and the temperature was just five degrees above zero with a negative three wind chill. And it became very clear to me that I, Dorothy, was no longer in Kansas. <laughs> and I immediately became homesick. I became homesick, called my grandmother and said, I've just been dropped off into Harvard Square and I've seen the most unbelievable things in this place. But I vividly remember one thing that I saw, and it wasn't the man spray painted with all silver standing as a statue in the middle of Harvard Square. I know many of you have probably seen that before. But what I vividly remember one day in the heart of winter, I remember having one of the most enlightening experiences of my short 30 years of living. I was waiting by the bus stop in Cambridge, and I, and I noticed four small children playing jump rope in the cold, brisk winds of a New England January. And it was obvious to me that these children were enjoying themselves because 
uh, be, they would enjoy themselves beyond description because the sound of their blissful exuberance exacerbated the urban sounds of tumultuousness that surrounded them. In the midst of all of the snow and angry drivers blowing their horns, homeless men fighting over bread in the streets, the city drunks wrestling in the gutters of a dusty Cambridge street, and the laughter of and playfulness and togetherness of these children, in spite of all of that noise, it was everything to them. Nothing else mattered in that moment but helping their fellow classmate in the middle to jump as high and as successfully as they could. They were simply enjoying a game of jump rope. For the two children on each end of the rope, they made sure that the speed at which they twirled the rainbow rope was compatible to the jumping skills of the man in the middle. Now, although the adults around them, much like myself, would have probably considered the climate outside to be too brisk for playing, these children allowed the warmth of their brother and sisterhood to eradicate the bitter bites of winter's breeze. And in this cold atmosphere, they played together, they giggled together, they worked together, they sang together, they counted together, they recited the alphabet together, they rotated who twirled and jumped so that everybody got a chance to participate. But what was most amazing to me about this experience was the fact that each of these children, each of them were both the same but also different. They were all human. All young, but the amazing thing is that they were all descendants of different races. One of them was black, one was white, one was Asian, and one was Latina. Here they were unbeknownst to them, but they were living and being the real life manifestation of the beloved community that Dr. King talked about. If only the world at large could grasp the same mentality as did these first graders who apparently valued the intrinsic human innocence of their ethnically diverse peer group over the cultural barricades of the subliminal, of subliminal American caste system. And when I witnessed this glorious sight, I stopped and I cried. Because it was in that moment that I realized the true meaning of Dr. King's statement that our human goal should be to create a beloved community and such will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our minds. You see, beloved, at the center of Dr. King's ministry as a social activist was the hope for a beloved community. He defined it as a harmonious global society founded by God's love for people and people's love for one another. And in these children, in the, oh, thank you so very much. I got a glass. I have one with me. Thank you. I'll take another one. Yes. In these children, I saw love, I saw patience, I saw togetherness and unity. These children were the face of God. They were the beloved community in living color. And the sad thing is many of us have not an understanding of community in our view today that is purely unconditional as did these innocent first graders. Many of us are so blinded by uh, uh, xenophobia, xenophobic constructs in our society that we fail to understand that all people should be respected. So for this reason, there are three lessons, three preacher points that I want to pull from this story about these small children. The first one is, we must learn that our responsibility as members of the beloved community is to worry about the man slash woman in the middle. These children understood that the game of jump rope was to spin the rope so that their peers could enjoy jumping. Unlike most of the other kids on the playground, these children that I was watching did not see this playtime as a time of competition. If the person in the middle tripped, they allowed them to get back up and try again. 
I dream for the day when we all worry more about the man slash woman in the middle than the wealthy American aristocrats that twirl the strings of our economy in order to trip up the poor folks in the middle. In this country, the wealthy take advantage of the poor in the middle, and many of us sit back and allow it to happen, especially those of us preachers who also use religion to rape the poor financially. We sit back and we silently allow, we sit back and we silently allow the wealthy persons of this country to make decisions about the needs of the downtrodden and the poor, and when the people in the middle trip up, we fail to give them another try. If we could only learn that we are all called by God yes, to worry about the persons in the middle, as did these children on the playground. In our economy, the man slash woman in the middle are those persons affected by the failures of the housing market. The man slash woman in the middle are those individuals living in rat infested public housing units and vermin filled slums in the inner cities. The man slash woman in the middle is the single unwed teenage mother who resorts to unprotected sex because the church mothers don't want to talk about sex and she ends up going into another avenue to subside her insecurities. The man slash woman in the middle is the man who commits suicide because the church allows him to play the organ but doesn't respect his orientation. The man slash woman in the middle are the Muslim brothers and sisters who when wearing their hijab and niqab are looked down upon simply because President Bush said that Islamic people blew up the World Trade Center. And a large quantity of our African American males are also caught in the middle, caught in what is called the mass incarceration complex. That is a result of the declaration on drugs called the war on drugs, which is just really let the white folks off on using larger drugs and lock up black folks for having a dime bag of marijuana. If you can't say amen, just look forward. <laughs> See, the wonderful thing I love about talking at these events, I don't have to bridle my tongue like I do in church. <laughs> so, beloved, we must learn to respect the person in the middle because it doesn't matter who you are. I'm going to say it just like my grandmama said. It don't matter who you is. You are special in the sight of God even if you're in the middle. If you're red, yellow, black, white, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, Catholic, short, fat, tall, skinny, cross-eyed, pigeon-toed, bow-legged, knee-knock, short hair, long hair, nappy hair, straight hair, kinky hair, no hair, gay, straight, confused, bisexual, dumb, mute, or even if you're just special, you are special. these children did not allow the bitter climate of the dangerously cold outside to keep them from playing. I'm going to say that one more time. I feel like a preacher now. These children did not allow the bitter climate of the dangerously cold outside to keep them from playing. Now that's fancy, big, ex ex not necessarily big words to just say what we all remember. Do you remember being young? And it didn't matter how cold it was outside, you just wanted to play. If you grew up in the country like me, down in the deep south, well, there was nothing to do but to play in the streets. Amen. We would play until the street lights came on. Didn't matter how cold it was outside. And my beloved brothers and sisters, many times I fear that we as African American people, we as uh, African American groups and African American churches, we allow the economic and political climates around us to silence our prophetic voices. We mustn't allow the cultural, political, economic, or sociological climates of this world to silence our mission to love ye one another and play in the limitless ropes of God that binds us together in inescapable love. 
Fifty years ago, President Johnson launched a bipartisan war on poverty, which led to the development of government programs such as Medicaid and food stamps. <coughs> During the same year, Martin Luther King Jr. and thousands of protesters marched on the mall in Washington, D.C. to acquire jobs for the unemployed, to raise the minimum wage for the employed, and to get civil rights for the ignored. But according to the Huffington Post, 50 years later, America is still dealing with poverty and still dealing with cultural racism. For instance, minority children are still four times more likely than white children to be born in poverty, live their entire lifespans in poverty, and suffer from diminished academic fluency and financial uncertainty. There exists an alarmingly significant gap between black and white household wealth and house ownership. And furthermore, the poverty rates of African Americans and Latinas greatly exceeds the national average. Now this lets us know that it is not enough to just celebrate the work of Dr. King. There is work to be done. As citizens of the free world, we must resist the temptations to sit on our laurels reflecting on how far the Lord done brought us since 1960. Instead, we must ask now that we've gotten this far, where do we go from here? Yes, black folks can eat at the same lunch counters as white folks, but a crumbling inner school educational system and an unsteady economy re reveals that there's more work to be done. Yes, the Civil Rights Bill was passed, but the Supreme Court struck down a key portion of the Voting Rights Act, revealing that there's more work to be done. Dr. King believed in the beloved community, but we've got to remember that just because Barack Obama is in the White House, that doesn't mean that the beloved community is really here. Then the last thing I want to share with you, beloved, is that I want us to gain from this living epistle of children is that America still got to have conversations about race. Beloved, we cannot and should not forget the earthquakes of racial injustice that hit our nation during the times of slavery and segregation. Furthermore, we must understand that what we are dealing with is not simply an aftershock of those tensions, but we are dealing with what the Bible describes as the groaning and moaning of the earth, earnestly waiting on us post the Obama era to deal with the true issues of this age. And I believe, brothers and sisters, I hate to burst your ideological bubble of utopianism, but racism still exists. According to Melissa Harris Perry, racism still exists. And it seems as if in our country, your race can cause you to even be left in the street like roadkill for four hours or choked and murdered on videotape while screaming, I can't breathe, and you still don't get justice. And you still don't get justice because there's this new thing going around called colorblindness. Colorblindness. An MTV researcher, David Bender, reveals that most people would rather not talk about racism anymore because it's not politically correct. But James Bowie said it like this, a generation that hates racism but chooses colorblindness is a generation that through its neglect continues to perpetuate the madness that it's running from. Colorblindness, beloved, is not the answer to the problems of race in America. White guilt is not the problem of race in America. Instead, what we really need is there for there to be true dialogue on the local level. For colorblindness is nothing but an upper middle class excuse to ignore issues in this country. There is no such thing as colorblindness. So we've got to bring color to the forefront to show that black is still beautiful. Black is still powerful. Black is still holy. And that doesn't mean that we're creating separatism. That means that we're saying in our unity, recognize my difference. For this is what it means to truly live together. 
So brothers and sisters, it's time to get to work. Somebody say it's time to get to work. Because it's not enough to just celebrate Dr. King with prayer breakfasts and middle class functions with dry chicken. <laughs> In fact, annual King celebrations today are far from what I believe Dr. King actually wanted. Dr. King's legacy should not just be remembered in monuments of stone or memorial services in the Times Square, but instead Dr. King's dream should change your behavior sometimes. Come on, come on. For it is my greatest fear that Dr. King's dream has become nothing more than a work of literature that is to be read or recited, rather than an epistle of instruction that is to be emulated and followed. So you've got to be the beloved community. And the way you can be the beloved community, beloved, is to realize that number one, Dr. King said it like this, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Number two, you've got to remember that life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And then the last thing that Dr. King reminds us is that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. So I've come to challenge somebody to take a step today. It's time to take a step. And when you take a step, there'll be no more innocent blood shed on the streets of the ghettos. When you take a step, there will be no more small-minded religious leaders burning the religious texts of others just trying to promote their own. When you step out, step out from your comfort zone, you will be able to turn hatred into love, evilness into justice, wickedness into righteousness, crookedness into honesty, rudeness into rectitude, partiality into equality, disparity into plenty, and close-mindedness into acceptance. For when you give in to the beloved community, you mean tell you what that means? Somebody say, tell me what it means. It means that you love everybody, help everybody, provide for everybody, protect everybody, respect everybody, revere everybody, assist everybody, support everybody, sustain everybody, care for everybody, be concerned about everybody, feel for everybody, hurt for everybody, sacrifice for everybody, hope for everybody, wish well for everybody, because the truth of the matter is everybody Everybody needs somebody because nobody seems to be worried about anybody but in the beloved community somebody will love everybody and nobody will be hurt by anybody because everybody will just be a nobody trying to tell everybody that you are a somebody let the church say amen Sister Martin, if you can join me up on this podium, please, and give this young man some recognition. Let me tell you something. We as preachers that do this for God, do it for God. And this man is anointed and he's blessed and favored. And I'd be remiss in my responsibility as a bishop if I didn't acknowledge God is in the house with this young man. Amen. Uh, so bless you, brother. Come and join us one more time. Reverend, 
on behalf of the Brockton Area Branch NAACP. We would like to give you this piece of, of little token of our love and appreciation, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Just some housekeeping items, amen, as we go forth towards our closing. We want to thank the uh, BCA Brockton Cable Access. Mark Lindy's here. God bless you all for covering this and the workers. These gentlemen do great work for our community. We also want to acknowledge that the NAACP Forum is back and operating on cable. I, I thank uh, the executive committee for blessing me with the responsibility of hosting that. And I hope I meet the expectations, not only of the NAACP, uh, but of the community as a whole. Yeah. I would be remiss in my responsibilities and not acknowledging uh, Temple Best function on tomorrow for Dr. King, the 20th annual luncheon at the Messiah Baptist Church tomorrow, uh, January 17th, beginning at 1215. Please put that on your calendar. And also the Cape Verdean Association, I apologize, I need to go to my phone. The Cape Verdean Association's function, which is Monday, beginning at 1 p.m., and that's going to be at 575 North Montello Street, uh, their offices. Uh, so we thank uh, all those that participate uh, in Dr. King's dream that should be active, that should be not only a dream, but that should be a vision that we are walking in. If you believe that, give yourself a hand clap. At this point, we will have closing remarks uh, from the president of the NAACP branch, Stephen Bernard. And if I've missed anything, again, I apologize. President Bernard, please. There's a celebration, a Martin Luther King celebration at St. Edith Stein Church on Monday. I wanted to let you know that uh, uh, there's a Martin Luther King celebration at St. Edith Stein Church on Monday. Also on the Sunday night, there is a memorial uh, for Josette Dubois uh, at the Arnon School from, uh, from 6 to 8. You're not looking at a fool. Wouldn't it be foolish for me to try to upstage or to say anything after, after listening to Reverend Brandon Crowley? So instead, I'm first going to uh, thank uh, <clears throat> Reverend Houston Creighton for giving us the benediction. Uh, and I'm going to thank him so much for uh, giving up his church for our first prostate cancer uh, meeting, which was held uh, last month. I'm sure Dr. Stern thanks him also. Aren't there some wonderful leaders in our community? And are we all a part of the beloved community? Amen. Raise your hand if you would like to be a part of our beloved community. Clap your hands if you believe. <laughs> to give us our benediction, Reverend Houston Creighton of Lincoln Congregational Church. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Steve. We share the same birth year. I know I look a little younger than he does. But... <laughs> He comes from a very athletic family. <laughs> yes. But I was just sitting there and I was thinking about my early uh, relationship with the NAACP when Nan Ellison was the president back in 1983. We had the first cable broadcast in Brockton in 1983, only a look. And NAACP worked very closely with Lincoln Congregational Church and the community at large and did some great things and I'm excited about Steve handling the uh, taking the reins of leadership with a great cast of uh, leaders that he assembled and I just was impressed upon 
to turn out on a rainy day. The sun is trying to come out. You folks acted up so much that the rain had to pull back. I was blessed today. This was a numinous event through the word, through the singing, and just the fellowship at large. And I certainly, I, I was talking to my wife. I said, you know, I wonder what kind of turnout we're going to have. We, I know broke ton broke tonians, you know. Brocktonians don't show up on a Saturday morning when it's raining, unless they're favorite singers there, you know. But uh, I was really impressed, and I applaud you all for showing up and being counted. You know, you can fake friendship, but you can't fake showing up. And when you show up, that says something. It says something when you're, I call it a ministry of presence. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. Just show up. And I wanted to show up for the NAACP today. Didn't matter if I preached a 10 minute homily or did a benediction or what. I just wanted somebody to see my face in the place to let them know that I care and appreciate what they're doing in the community. Let us all stand. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for a most numinous event, most spiritual event. We thank you for the word that was preached on today that enlightened and also encouraged, preferably inspired. Thank you for all the songs that were sung, talking about justice, freedom, and righteousness that does not only be an academic uh, activity, but it might be one that is practical in how we uh, walk from this place into our community, and that somehow we will have uh, our wills be energized to do and, and to fulfill the legacy that Dr. King had as spouse. We ask that you would um, continue to bring this community together in dialogue, to have the conversations that needed to make this truly a city of champions. Now unto him who was able to keep you from falling, present you faultless of his glory with exceeding joy. The only wise God, our Savior, glory, dominion, power, majesty now and forever. Let us all say amen together. Amen. Amen.